If I have to write something, be it an email or something I have to submit to the court to proofread it, I have to read it. Well, I don't always, but I should always read it backwards. And I think wow. the thing that that um, is common, I believe, uh, for a lot of dyslexics is you get labeled as not trying hard enough mm. or perhaps being lazy, which couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I submit to you that most dys dyslexics are trying harder than people that don't have it. Um, and so, yeah, and so that can, that can be very difficult to, to sort of reconcile. You're listening to The Jeff Hopeg Show, conversations with interesting humans. I have a fascinating individual sitting here with me today by the name of Stacy Miller. And uh, the one big change in, uh, in season two is that I'm going to go into a little story of how exactly I've met, uh, met the guests sure. uh, sitting here. So uh, I own a marketing company called Killer Shark, and uh, the gentleman that runs it, his name is Chris Scully, and he's been with me all the way back since 2006. Chris and Stacy here uh, went to college at Wake Forest, Wake Forest right? University, un un undergrad, and then had a fascinating, was it a year, two, two years, uh, traveling it, the it world? It was better part of a year. Yeah, yeah, better part of a year, just traveling the world, living abroad, living it up, trying to figure out, I guess, went, what went it is. all the way around the world again. <laughs> what you what you want to what you want to be in life. So that's how uh, that's how we got connected. Chris has been talking for a long time about Stacy and his story. Stacy's in uh, uh, North Carolina, correct? Um, and yes, an incredibly well known, um, prominent trial lawyer. And we're going to get into a little bit of that. But what's remarkable, remarkable about this story is the learning disability that I now understand one in five people struggle with in America, one in five from the right. National Institute of Health, one in five people struggle with this. And we're going to get in and focus on that part of the story because that's what's remarkable, what this man right here overcame to become the fire festival lawyer which is now like his your, your new name and your new brand right what <laughs> <The> fire festival <laughs> but a couple big big cases that you're part of and and i can't wait to get into that so first off thank you for yeah being thank there. you for having me it's yeah. um i'm excited about it and, a little nervous of course <laughs> yeah and, and and that's okay you'll be fine getting up in front of a jury and convincing right 12 people <laughs> well, i'm normally not talking about myself <laughs> that's a big difference so yeah, a lot of people know know you as the uh, the fire festival lawyer. You said even you were in New York City, and somebody recognized. Yeah, you? and so in some circles, <laughs> I guess um, it, it's just incredible. How, and we'll talk about that a yeah. little bit on the show. But um, before we get into that come up story, the fascinating part, like I like to refer to it as, um, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about these cases. So, what, what is this fire festival? What's, what's this all oh, about? Oh, yeah. Well, it, it was quite the event that never happened, right? Yeah. And, and so Billy McFarlane decided to put on this, this music event, invite some famous acts down in the Bahamas. And it, uh, he was well over his skis and, and it you know, promised luxury villas and yeah. this five-star <laughs> experience. And instead, people were, were eating cheese sandwiches and living in tents. So it was quite the sort yeah. of bait and switch. Yeah, yeah. And and there's a it's a documentary. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a documentary out. There's I a couple of documentaries out there, but the one I was in was Netflix. Yeah, was on Netflix. I remember watching it before Chris even telling me about your story. So I knew it. Right. I knew it knew it already. So it's just so cool to to have you here. But how about how about some of the other ones? So the uh, the NCAA. Tells yeah. Us about so that. I represent the Cardiac <clears throat> Pack, which is the 1983 Men's National Championship Team. Yeah. NC State University, um, who went on a, just a historic Cinderella story to win the national championship, and we're representing the the team versus the NCAA in, in an NIL lawsuit named yeah. name, image, and likeness. Okay, and so that that that's currently going on right now, mm -hmm. and so I think it's a it's a you know profound case that has a lot of implications. Yeah. Okay. And then there's another big one. The camp, the camp was right. right. So I think a lot of people have probably seen the commercials in camp was <laughs> sure. So yeah, there's a collection of lawyers that were was picked by the court to serve as leadership for all the cases in the country. Okay, 
Um, and I'm on that leadership team. I mm -hmm. think right now there's over a half a million claims filed. And so as the leadership of the Camp Lejeune, we're in charge of, of, uh, of prosecuting some of the selective cases. Yeah. They're called bellwether cases okay. that are representative for each disease. There's multiple diseases that these Marines and dependents and government contract workers have, have, are suffering. Yeah. And so we will be trying these diseases mm -hmm. to, to, to obtain values, yeah. to hopefully plug into a, a general global settlement grid sure. to, to, to get these people the justice they so deserve. Yeah, that's remarkable. So if I, if I met you... And then whether I Googled you or we talked for a little bit and you told me about these cases, I would leave and go, wow, that's pretty cool. I met a successful lawyer. But you're sitting in a chair on a show called Interesting Humans for a reason, right? And I think what's most remarkable is how much you've overcome in life. And I want to go all the way back now. So let's go back to your early Early childhood memories. What 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 was school like? And let's start talking about the the disability and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it actually it's, it didn't really predict it being so emotional, but it it, it really is. And so I, I have um, I have dyslexia. So mm -hmm. um, and I ha you know, I've always had it, still have it. It's never going away. Mm -hmm. So school for me um, has been a big challenge. It's, it's it's never been in the category of fun. Yeah. Um, reading is something that that I struggle with today, mm -hmm. always have been. Um, and, you know, and, you know, when I was, I'm 59, and so, I mean, I was born in 65, so at 10 years old, 9 years old, was 74, yeah. 1974, you, you know, there just wasn't a whole lot we knew about sure. dyslexia. Sure, sure. What, what was it like as, a, as an 8- or 9-year-old go, go, going to school each day? Yeah, so it... It was something that I had a lot of anxiety about. Uh, I knew I, I knew I was different. Of course, I had no idea exactly how, but I, I knew I was different. I was put in the lower classes for reading um, throughout, you know, elementary school. So you, you sort of know that you're not you're, you're not adequate or you're insufficient in some ways. Right. And so, you know, I remember in first grade where you, you had, there was this poster board and the books that you read, you'd get like a little star and everybody would have these stars mm -hmm. go down the poster room and I didn't have any stars. Uh, and so, you, you know, you were, you felt less than for sure. Yeah. And what would, what would it be like, like when you were reading as a classroom, you had a, I would think you were nervous. You didn't want to be called on next or. Oh, that was petrifying. The, uh, you know, you, you take turns reading out loud and I just couldn't do it I mean I just couldn't you know and, it, and it's worse than when you're reading to yourself like reading out loud because it kicks in <clears throat> more anxiety and, and and that sort of thing so and so yeah it, it was intimidating yeah. today I mean to this day this very day uh, I thank you for having me on the show but please don't ask me to read it loud <laughs> <laughs> but you can let you can let li you'll listen right? yeah for sure like I mean the, yeah the, the, the listening part that's incredible you said something last night that you read your notes, your trial notes? How do you read those? Uh, oh, well, yeah. So if I have to write something, be it an email or something I have to submit to the court, um, to proofread it, I have to read it. Well, I don't always, but I should always read it backwards. Because backwards. for me, my dyslexia manifests this way. I don't, I leave out words. So I, I, I predominantly think and see in pictures. Yeah. And so... You know, you can absorb pictures faster than words. Everybody can. Yeah. But I, so I, I, I skip words. I don't see words. When I'm reading, I just don't see them sometimes. Right. And my eyes get going too fast and I try to slow down. Or when I write, uh, I, 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 I skip words like, you know, many prepositions or maybe like however, therefore, because there's no picture to those. And wow. so I have to slow up. And then by reading backwards, I see the holes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily help me with my spelling. Yeah. Um, but I, I can see proofread where, where, where I will leave words out. Where'd you, where did you even learn to do that? Yeah. Try doing that. So, yeah, we were talking about a little about that last night. <clears throat> I, so I, I call her the angel in my life. She was my seventh grade English teacher, Sylvia White. Oh, 
Wow. And just as you know, as fate would have it, uh, blessings that she taught me English in seventh grade, ninth grade, and then my senior year in high school. So I, I made it all the way to seventh grade before um, before I was diagnosed with dyslexia. Yeah. And, um, you know, I always say Sylvia, she wasn't a teacher. She was an educator. Oh. And she stayed with me through college, you know, called me the night before the bar exam, all sorts of stuff. So we still stay in contact to this day. Wow. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm blessed. You know, and there's been a lot of people in my life that, that that's helped me and made a difference. And yeah. So, you know. Sounds like she was. And I, look, I, I don't pretend to be the expert on this subject. Sure. I can just, you know, tell you what I've lived through. There's a spectrum mm-hmm. of dyslexia, so I'm sure people have it way worse than me yeah yeah so how, how did she come into your life she was my seventh grade english teacher oh she was your teacher yeah okay she, yeah not a teacher she was your she was my teacher, teacher in seventh grade did she recognize like did she call this yeah at that time she, she, yeah, she, yeah she did so she named it she named it was she the first person to name it the very first person to name it. so all the way up to seventh grade so you know and, and i think wow. the thing that that um is common i, I believe uh, for a lot of dyslexics is you get labeled as not trying hard enough mm. or perhaps being lazy, which couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, I submit to you that most dys- dyslexics are trying harder than people that don't have it. Um, and so, wow. yeah. And so that can, that can be very difficult to, to sort of reconcile. Yeah. But she was able to see it early, early in my seventh grade year. And give me, you know, tips and suggestions. And yeah. And then stayed with you and stayed committed to even calling you, what was it, before your bar exam? Yeah, she called me for the bar exam to tell oh, me I was going to be fine. Yeah. Wow. What did it, what did uh, it feel like? I mean, you know, it means a words? lot because I think, you know, one of the problem, one of the challenges, I think, is you just don't have a very good conversation with yourself because you know that, that you're, you're different. <clears throat> And that you struggle, so you don't have um, the confidence, or you don't feel like you're smart. Mm. And that was been, I've been a, you know, a struggle for me. It was a secret. I, it was a secret I kept all the way through college. You know, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, you know, it was a secret in law school. So I, yeah. I didn't, you know, because a lot of people think, well, you're not smart if you have if if you're dyslexic. Right. Did you ever advocate like or advocate for yourself and tell the teacher like? Hey, I don't know. I, can't, I don't get it, or I can't read. No, it. never, never, never. Was that was that ever mentioned at home? Did your parents like maybe ever encourage you, like, hey, when you go in, tell them that you're struggling or anything like that? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, yeah. I have a very my, my sister, very smart. My dad was a physician, very yeah. smart. Yeah. And so you know, and look, I'm not blaming them by any stretch of the imagination. If anything, I was given a lot of uh, extra help. Mm. And, 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 you know, um, I always say in life, even the, the brightest light casts a shadow, right? And so, but, but, but I knew that I needed, you know, it was just programmed in me when you get picked up in the summer from baseball practice to go to a tutor that you're slower and slower equates to not being as smart. Yeah. And so that, that was sort of the, the side to it that, that, that's always, that always it's been wow. the lifelong challenge, I think. Yeah. So that's why I kept it a secret. Right. Right. Tucked in. Yeah. Only you knew it. What what do you tell the young Stacy Miller at this point? The yeah. Eight year old. Yeah. So I you know, interestingly enough, I have a seven year old. Mm. I started late in life with kids. Yeah. Which I absolutely um love. I indulge myself, quite frankly, I love it. Um <laughs> so I have two boys. Yeah. I have a, one that just turned four and one that just turned seven. And so I I was, you know, very afraid that, that they might I might pass this along because I think there's some relative information out there that this could this could be in, inheritable. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think my seven year old ha- has it, but it but if he did, I guess I would just tell him that, you know, well, you are smart. Uh you deserve to be right where your peers are. Yeah. Um, in fact, you might be able to do certain things better because of it. And and I, I don't want to use the word in spite. You know, I almost just said in spite of your dyslexia, which almost gives it too much control over you. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that's been my struggle. Um, and it still is. Um, and so I would say, yeah, you, you have some some abilities that perhaps other people don't have. 
yeah. that's going to serve you well. Right. I mean, at the same time, it's going to be, school's not going to be easy for you. Sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's remarkable to know the contrast. And of course, you didn't know when you were eight what life was going to look like in 50 years after that. But it's it's remarkable. Yeah. What you've accomplished well, thank you. what you've been through. <laughs> <laughs> I see here very nervous right now because it's a subject matter that I... I haven't, you know, spoken up about, and maybe I've been irresponsible in telling my story, um, but it, it, it does bring about a level of anxiety. It just I, hope, I, hope, I hope the right people, but I hope so many people get to listen to this episode, get that privilege to listen to this episode, because if NIH is telling us that one in five are affected somehow by this, that's a giant number that leads me to believe it's probably even higher than one in five. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if, you know, if you have a child that is showing signs of it, and I, th- and I think today's um, teachers are, are better equipped to recognize it mm. early. And so the earlier you, you recognize it, I think the better, but, but I can tell you your child is not having a conversation with himself. That's positive. And I think the earlier you can, teach them to reframe that conversation they're having with themselves, the, um, the happier or, or more they'll like themselves, what quite is, frankly. Yeah, that's awesome. What, what does that conversation look like that they're having with themselves? Uh, you're not smart. You know, you're, you're behind. And so, uh, oh, wow. yeah, so that, that's tough. Is there, do you, do you think there's a period of time where they're having a conversation and, and, and they are going through that frustration, and it could be months, even years, before they're told they're dyslexic? Or are they getting it pretty early on now? You know, I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, I, I'd like to think that, that they're getting it on earlier on. And, and the quicker you intervene, the, 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 I guess the fewer years, you know, in my case, uh, you know, undoing this conversation I've had with myself has taken years. Yeah. You know, and I still work on it today. And this is just my theory. Like, you yeah. know, there's many people that are sort of better situated to, to talk about this, but I can just tell you my experiences, right? Right. Right. Incredible. Okay. What did sports look like? And when did all that start? Yeah. So uh, I've I was fortunate. I, I was I, I was blessed to be a good athlete. And so that helped me a lot with my peers. Yeah. Um you know, uh, I, I played football, basketball, ran track and played baseball and, you know, went to college to play football. Baseball was probably my best sport. And so I, I, I was I was in the in crowd yeah. with respect to that. So that that was a tremendous <clears throat> blessing. Right. Um, and so uh, without that, I think it would have been even more of a struggle. Right. And there's plenty of kids that are probably battling some sort of learning challenges. I like to use the word challenge instead of like, you know, problem or learning disability. Okay. Um, that's just, you know, and, and, and may perhaps are not good athletes or, or not accepted. Uh, perhaps they're good musicians. So, I, I mean, th- there's something out there that we're all good at, right? Yeah. And there's something out there that I think probably we all are challenged by. <clears throat> and so it's important to find that thing, whether it's art. Um, you know, dyslexics, and in, in me included in this, and, and I didn't really realize this. Are, are really good at sometimes spatial awareness. Okay. And so I can sort of see things. Um, and it's easy for me to sort of place things and spatially bring them together. And, 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 and so we're good at, you know, thinking outside the box. Yeah. And so you see a lot of architects, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. uh, who are dyslexics, musicians. Yeah. I think MIT, there's a joke out there that, that that's the, the school for dyslexics because there's a lot of dyslexics at MIT and those wow. kids are like uber bright, right? Right, right, right. Wow. Interesting. Okay. How does it, how does having it affect or maybe even help and support your career? Yeah. Today? So, you know, I fell into an area wherein it just, I call it my um, superpower, my secret. Superpower. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's part of perhaps changing the narrative on this, but, but I, you know, I, I think in pictures. And so w- w- the people I represent in torts, I'm a personal injury lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's car accidents, product liability, medical malpractice. 
And so there, there's a story there. Right. Think about it. Right. Somebody got hurt. Yeah. And there's a fax. There's a series of events that happened. And so even the body itself is a machine. Yeah. And okay. so it's like a co- engine. You can see how it works. Yeah. And so you can actually visualize it. Yeah. Whereas a tax lawyer, I, I would, I'd starve. Right. Mm. And so, so just fortunately for me, I found that little area that just makes sense to me because I can see it. Yeah. And did you know that in college? Like, did you know it in law school? Or is that even too early to know that, to, to realize that? Well, I mean, you know, you don't know what's driving what. I, I had an interest in the, sort of this area that I'm in, probably because I like people. Okay. And so a lot of dyslexics are, are, are people, have great people skills. I, I'm pretty good at, about reading a room and yeah. getting to know people. And so the, the, the personal injury, so you, you represent people. Right. Right. Okay. Um, instead of insurance companies or corporations and that yeah. sort of thing. And, and, and so, I, and it became easy to, for me to remember what happened to them. Mm. I didn't have, you know, that came become really easy. Yeah. Because uh, I don't really have to remember anything because it just stays with me. Yeah. And how does the like picture, you, you said like you see things in pictures. How does that relate to your, your career? Yeah. So, so when I'm given a jury argument, I'm telling a story and it's just a story of what I see. Okay. And like dealing with accident reconstruction, <clears throat> mm-hmm. which I love, and you just sort of figure out, you're, you're given information and you figure out what happened sometimes because if there's an automobile accident and nobody survives the accident, yeah. you have now black box data. Right. And, and, it, and it's, it's a combination of math and physics and geometry and all that sort of stuff. And you can sort of see it yeah. for me. Yeah. And so that, 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 that's why I enjoy it enjoy this area yeah did you have a favorite subject that was sort of like a theme throughout your life were you a science guy or a you know I, I, i'm not sure or... <laughs> i'm not sure what i was <laughs> or none of them yeah i, I know I, was yeah. None of them. I didn't like any of them. <laughs> maybe history or, yeah history or, was I mean, great i, I did think... did enjoy history yeah right you've got a love it sounds like for government you, you love talking like government stuff I yeah i, I, I did sense I did. it yeah you know which is really cool all right so you had a major turning point, and I want to focus on that, a, a big turning point with your seventh grade teacher. That, yeah, it has me thinking, what does life look like had the seventh grade teacher not been there, right? That angel. Oh, Did I, you ever think of that? Uh, I try not to. I'm scared to think what that might have looked look, <laughs> looking like. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so she she was tremendous to me, and and there's been a couple of people along the way too. I had a professor at Wake Forest University that I took over and over again. Chris mm-hmm. and I had him together. Yeah, um, Dr. Alan Loudon, who seemed to take an interest in me, and um, and of course my current wife, I, I, you know, has been tremendously helpful mm-hmm. for me too. Um, yeah, yeah, helpful and and such. What was the the professor Alan Loudon? What, what was that? How'd you meet yeah, him? so he, he taught in the speech communication department at Wake Forest University. And so um, <clears throat> both Chris and I majored in, in that, and, and we took a lot of classes. And he taught this one class called debate. At that point in time, I, I decided that perhaps I wanted to go to law school. And so I, I remember going up to Dr. Loud and then saying, hey, look, I, I, I need an A in your class. And he said, <laughs> wow. he said, he said, I'll give you an A. You, all you got to do is come to class. That's all you got to do. But you have to join the debate team. Oh, no. And so I roped Chris into joining the debate team with me. And, and as Chris likes to say, we were walk-ons on the debate team. Because Wake Forest had just won the national championship in debate. In debate. So we were <laughs> in over our head from the beginning. No way. <sighs> and so that, 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 that lit a fire. Yeah. And, and, and realized for me that, hey, you know, I wasn't the best – Right. Person on the debate team. I wasn't the best person on the football team, but 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 I could do it, you right. know. And and so I, and it, and, and I, I was good at it to, to some degree. <laughs> did you get the A? I did get the A. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fascinating time because, quite frankly, that was the same semester that the Bush Dukakis debate happened at Wake Forest oh, University. Oh yeah. And so it was just a really cool time to be in debate class on the debate team. Right. While the 
you know, presidential debate was happening on the campus. Wow. And that ha- they were there. They were there. In person. Yeah. Did, did you like that kind of stuff? Like, did you like the debate stuff? Yeah, I mean, like- I did. It's exchanging ideas, you, you know, and, it, and it, you know, it's 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 a challenge. So that that really gave you the momentum, Tantor Law School. Yeah, and say. I was I was asked to be on the student judicial board. Uh, a friend of ours in a fraternity was president of the student body. <clears throat> will yeah. connect, and a person had to step down off the student judicial board, and he asked me to be on the student student judicial board and so that that too was pretty neat yeah and so i was like this is this is you know um interesting and that's so a turning like, maybe point. i'll go to law school yeah so that's a major turning point yeah for sure it, it, that came first getting on debate came first then law then like that helped fuel your desire to go to law school yeah for sure is that safe yeah okay Ah, oh, so not the other way around. You didn't, you weren't thinking I'm going to be a lawyer, so let me go to no. I mean, the last debate. thing going to law school, you just want to go to school more, <laughs> <laughs> right? The right. very place that you probably just didn't you didn't yeah. you didn't enjoy. Wow. How about books and like where do you where do you get a, a, most of your education now from? Yeah, I do a lot of books on tape, and I got to give give my wife credit for this. Mm. Um, she's been very encouraging. My wife's like really smart. Mm very academic, um, and we both love to learn. And that's one thing I really say that I actually really enjoy learning. Yeah. Um, and so we listen to a lot of books on tape. Okay. Um, and whatever she comes up with, I'm always ready to do it because whatever she comes up with, up with has been so good. Yeah. Whether it's self-help books, whether it's uh, books sure. about <clears throat> nutrition or health or business books or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. I'm like a deep diver in my learning. I'll get fixated on a subject and forget about it for a month. I will do, I will read everything, watch everything, watch every documentary. Are you like that? Or you sort of keep it spaced out? And No, we, 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 we do. We, we typically get on a subject and, and, yeah. and listen to a couple of books on tape. Yeah. We were in a Peter Atia kick mm. for a while, and his book, Outlive, just to sort of like more integrative medicine on how do you live healthier, longer. Interesting. And sort of like fight the fight of metabolic syndrome, mm-hmm. which I think so many Americans are starting to get type two diabetes, high blood pressure, yeah. you know, those sort of things and what you do to, 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 to you know, overcome those. So he's talking to everything, the full gamut from diet to exercise yeah. and everything through. Does he have any, special any unique i'd just be curious well i mean i so i think on the <clears throat> sort of triage of hierarchy exercise is always the top right yeah. okay and so you've got to burn sugar yeah right you really you really do and it helps your your high blood pressure yeah it, it helps the, you know your if your a1c starts creeping up your 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 muscles i think you know i think he says the biggest predictor mm-hmm. of longevity is your vo2 max and your muscle mass index, right? Ah. And so, and there's no substitute. There's no way around it. You have to exercise. And no so for me, I, I try to do that. I try to do what was, what's called zone four intervals once or twice a week. Huh. Stay in zone two, uh, which is different depending upon how old you are. Yeah. And then lift weights. You have to lift weights. You right. have to lift weights. You got I don't like lifting weights, but I do it. Yeah, but well, you have to. Interesting. Okay. Um and the book's called Outlive. Outlive. Does any of that tie into dyslexia? Like, does it help you? Does it help you? Do you notice in any way? My, Diet, exercise, any of that? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, so if, if if I can keep my anxiety levels down, it seems to get worse for me. Um, my eyes just—I don't know how to describe it for me. So sometimes the you know the B's and the D's, lowercase B's and D's, get mixed up for me. C's and E's, and sometimes A's. Lowercase b. Yeah, and in the in the in the in the words, not individual words, but like the whole page or paragraph will just move toggle a little bit, and um, and you know I don't I don't know whether it's been proven that it correlates with being tired or stressed, but I typically try to shut it down when I'm tired because I I just don't do well. 
and I, and I was, you know, like talking about earlier, like you, you know, I could take somebody like, like Chris Scully, he, if he and I sat down and we both read for an hour, mm -hmm. I can promise you, I would be more mentally fatigued. Okay. Than somebody who does not have dyslexia. And so you just have to say, okay, like I'm pretty good about being disciplined because mm -hmm. I've sort of had to be. So I don't do <clears throat> well. I'm not all nighter guy, guy kind of guy. Yeah. I can't get away with it. So I, it was a point of diminishing return for me quicker than most people. Yeah. And so I, like when I was in law school, I, I went to class in between classes. I didn't mess around, went to the library, you know, and so I was very efficient. Right. Uh, because come, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, uh, yeah. I just, I can't, I don't digest it. You've got to get, you're done. Your yeah. mind like gets in that. What did you say? The words bounce or the paragraphs bounce? Yeah, just move. They just slightly move a little bit. The, the word I use is toggle back and forth huh. slightly. Uh, not all the time. Yeah. Um, but I, I will miss words. Yeah. 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 And so it, it, it took me in law school. You, well, you do read a lot. I mean, you read a lot in law school. So I, it just took, takes me. Longer, but if you uh, noticed that if I was just very efficient and um, didn't waste time, mm -hmm. I was was able to just you know be done with it my day. Yeah. Before a lot of people. Yeah, it's interesting. You had a you had an awesome quote last night. Something about being unique. We're just a, a page in the book. What was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I've read this book, um, I think when I was around 49 or 50. It was called The Gift of Dyslexia. Okay. And it was like, really, I had to put it down a couple of times because it just got so emotional reading. And I just felt like nothing else captured what I was going through quite like that book. Um, and then it sort of dawned on me that, you know, we're not really all of us. Mm. We're not unique, you know we're really a chapter in a book somewhere. Yeah. And so oh, that's, that's so very cool. sort of freeing. It sure it is. And, and so, yeah. And so that, that was very helpful. Yeah. Wow. What is it? What does conversation look like now for you at 59? You said when you were a kid, like conversation in your head's not good. What is it like now? Is it even matter? Does it bother you? No. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, yeah, it's there. It's it is. there. I mean, you know, I, I'm in an academic profession, really. Yeah. And so when we get together for the leadership group in Lejeune, or I'm talking to other lawyers, co-counsels, you know, it comes up. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to, like, we so funny. We were all, all together um, going through cases to select the, some of the cases we wanted to pick for bellwether, track one bellwether diseases. Yeah. And we needed somebody to get up and write on the whiteboard. And I was like, please don't pick the dyslexic kid. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that, you know, it's funny. I like to laugh about it. But, you know, it, it is funny, but it's not funny, right? Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, it, it's there. I mean, it's not going anywhere. Wow. So, yeah. And so I don't, you know, I don't like, you know. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm probably the worst speller you've ever met. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Truly. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Great that you know that. The awareness is incredible. Wow. All right. Um, I like that Outlive book. I gotta, I'm definitely going to look into that. You said Zone 4 Intervals. Yeah, Zone 4 and 5 yeah, Intervals. I are, love it. Are, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned something else yesterday, which I'm just blown away by. Um, you talked about, like, I, I asked you a question, a mantra, and your response back was, like, incredible. Remember about your work, your ethic, and your... Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I sort of have this opinion that nobody's going to outwork me, yeah, out-hustle me. And, you know, and, and, and for dyslexics, I mean, I guess you just have to have a certain level of perseverance is the guess word I, I would pick. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and you know, we're, we're used to having to try hard. And, you know, and look, and like I think I mentioned last night, somebody says, well, you try your best. I don't know exactly what that means. Because if you ever <laughs> right. look back and, you know, you can always try harder. Sure. Right. So I, I never give myself permission to say you've tried, you, you've done all you can do because you yeah. really, there's always something you can do more. Yeah. But I don't, I, I do think that that's my, one of my, something I take pride on that, that, that I'm going to hustle. You know, you're going to... Yeah, yeah, I'm probably going to outwork you. Whether it's 
in time spent or whatever whatever variable it is you just know you're certain that you're going to approach a project like that well i mean i think it comes from the fear of being unprepared and called on yeah and so you do everything you can do yeah um to be prepared does and does that tie into you you shared a little about going like going to the airport and that type of thing Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, anxiety has been a battle for me my whole life, yeah. you know, my whole life. I, I had chronic nightmares. I, I was I was a bed wetter until I was about nine. Yeah. And so it, it's been it's been it's been hard. And so, you know, my wife was making fun of me because I, I wanted to get to the airport like three hours before my flight. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so she helps calm me. She does. And so being aware of it and sometimes I'm just not aware of it right she seems to let me know in a kind way yeah right and 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 so I try to listen yeah sometimes I'm not so good at it <laughs> <laughs> so I could I'd have to imagine that as an eight and nine year old still bedwetting like that's got to be challenging for sleepovers and that whole world right i mean what did that look like oh yeah i mean you know you want to don't want to go over to somebody's house because you're going to keep them all up at night because you have nightmares and then you wet the bed so it's not something that i wouldn't go over to i wouldn't go i wouldn't go you right get me to go which is a big that's a big developmental yeah. piece of your life that d- yeah and i'm exist. not sure i mean looking back on things you can figure things out in in, in hindsight yeah but at the time you know i i don't think <clears throat> we were able to identify that if in fact it was, which I think it is sure was identified with my struggle to read. Right. And so things come out, you know, as a child, when you're anxious, you can't put words to your struggles. Yeah. And, you know, reading's a big one. I mean, you know, look, it, 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 it's not as bad as other, other people have bigger struggles than I have. Right. I'm not trying to, you know, yeah, paint mine is, is, is worse than theirs but you know reading's a big one right sure huge is the message is the message to the listener right now if you're struggling in reading to speak up what's the message i i, th- I think i think if it, to parents if you notice that your child is not getting words right um hates to read doesn't spell very well um, get them tested, right? Yeah. Uncover it, all right? Yeah. Uncover it. Bring it out to light. Bring it out, okay. And and talk about how to, you know, the things they do do well. Okay. And um, I think that that's that's important. Let's focus on what you can do, mm-hmm. okay? And and be encouraging to that, and, and understand that that you'll get better at reading. Sure. Right. But you're never for me. I'm never going to read as well as is probably those people who don't have dyslexia. Sure. Uh, now I might get the content as well, relatively speaking. It depends on what we're talking about. Yeah. I'm not, my standardized tests were horrible, and I, I they would be today, right? Yeah. Um, but but I think if, you know, let's talk about it early. Let's, 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 let's try to frame that conversation. Right. Because you can be successful in life with dyslexia. In fact, you've got strengths that other folks might not have. And, and I think you can lean into those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is, would another message be, it, it doesn't define you? Is that something to say? I want to make sure I don't, I'm not like recommending the wrong thing to people. Like if you have this, which one of five, one in five have it, like life's not over. No, not at right? all. I mean, it's not who you are. You can't be defined by it. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, Cause you know, life is, multifactorial you, there's so much to do in life and you you there's a path for you there's absolutely a path yeah. for you yeah and you've you have you have proven that and that's again that goes back to the beginning of today's show is like that's what's fascinating to me is like okay you've identified a little later in life than most just because there's testing out there now but you've also figured out ways and brought the right resources into life to help you continue to grow, prosper, thrive, despite, right? Right. right. Uh, it, 
Yes. I mean, at the end of the day. Okay. So let's move, let's talk about college a little bit more. And like, what, what did that look like undergrad? I want to come back to that. So it was Wake Forest. Yes. Did you know what you wanted to do, what you wanted to be? What, what did that all look like? No, I had, <clears throat> I had no idea. Um, I mean, there's certain things I, I, you know, I was really good in chemistry. Mm-hmm. So I took chemistry because I was successful at it. Um, and, and so I didn't really get inspired to school. You know, fortunately for me, yeah. um, I fell in with a bunch of smart, smart guys. Yeah. I mean, Chris it was one of them. Chris is definitely one really? of them. <laughs> I mean, it, it was uncool <laughs> not to do well. Yeah. Now, it was also, you got picked on for studying more than everybody else. Yeah. I would go hide. Right. I would hide in the library and study. Mm. I wouldn't let anybody know how long I studied. <laughs> right. and, but, but yeah, I have really bright friends. I mean, and, and they're sure. wildly successful, all of them yeah. today. Yeah. And so that, 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 that was very helpful for me. Sure. Because the benchmark, yeah. you, know, you, wanted to, you wanted to fit in. And so it was, I found it, um, you know, it gave me a lot of motivation. Did you, did you make friends easily? I've always made friends easily. So no issue there. No issue. No like no. lack of confidence. Was there ever like, I'm afraid they're going to find out what I have or like what's yes. wrong with me? Yeah, but I've always enjoyed people, you know, and, and, and I've just had, you know, I, I like to learn about people. So if you ask questions about people about themselves, they love to talk about, it, you know? Oh, yeah. And so, I, you know, <laughs> it, I, this is something, that, you know, my dad, my dad was fabulous at that. You know, I always say the difference between my dad and, and me is where I probably would have been a very average dermatologist. He'd have been a heck of a trial lawyer. Right? <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that for, meeting friends was, was, was something I enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned your dad a couple of times last night. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so my dad. My dad was my hero. He he was the first person to go to college in his family. He grew up in a very poor, poor rural rural part of North Carolina, yeah. outside a little town called Benson, hmm. and went to the University of North Carolina and ended up making it to medical school. You know, and I look at my life and the amount of resources and help that I've had has yeah. been tremendous. Sure, he didn't have all that. Right. And so he, he, he just was, you know, and so he, he was, he set an example for me that I wanted to do for my kids. He worked hard. He hustled. And so it made a big impact on me. Yeah. And he made an impact in his, in his field, right? Oh yeah. He was a pioneer. Yeah. He was a dermatologist. He did hair transplants back when that was just a a thing. Just getting started out. Yeah. And so he was one of two dermatologists in Raleigh, North Carolina at, at one point. You know, Raleigh has grown so much now. One of two? One of two. Wow. And so he's done. He did really well. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any desire to follow that path? Did you ever think about it? Just you know, like I it? did. Uh, and I still am fascinated with medicine. It's part of what I yeah. do. But I just remember thinking, I remember asking him, well, what if you go to medical school and you become an orthopedic and you decide, well, wait a minute. I think I want to become a cardiologist. I mean, you're stuck, right? Oh. With law, you can turn your shoulders. <clears throat> yeah. And I've done a lot of that. I, I represent people in the in the False Claims Act for whistleblowers. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a lot of that. The, the NIL is an example. The, yeah. You know, products liability. Right. Carex. And so I'm able to have a, you know, turn my shoulders a little bit. Yeah. And not that you, you know, there's not variations within the practice of medicine that, that you can do. But I, 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 it just was, um, I guess, just fit my proclivities a little bit more than yeah. perhaps practicing. Yeah, I hear the diversity. You're yeah. like jumping from this to this. Do you have a favorite day? Uh, anything stand out in the courtroom? No, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's some cases that, that um, you know, I, I, I don't like a bully. And so, you know, go, going represent somebody that's been bullied has always been some of my favorites. Um, you know, there's been some profound cases that they're just tragedy, unspeakable tragedy. And the oh. sort of the top of the list is, is probably Weston Andro. He was a seven-year-old uh, little boy from, from Ohio. And, and he and his family went to North Carolina to, and rented a beach house out of the Outer Banks in North Carolina. And he, um, they had just gotten there about 30 minutes, and he was playing in, a, in, in the elevator in the home and got entrapped in the elevator and, and lost his life. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think 
you know, when we represent people that get hurt, is the it's the kids, it's the, the young kids that, that's the hardest to deal with. So Weston was um, a beautiful child, and there's there's been a problem with kids being entrapped in elevators, and it's happened numerous times, and the elevator industry has known this is a problem right? Um, since the 40s. And some manufacturers have done recalls, others haven't. And so um, Weston's case we, we, there's there's a defect mm-hmm. and so the, the 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 door of the house to the elevator is called the hoistway door and the door to the elevator um most time is an accordion door yeah and there's only supposed to be a between the two there's only supposed to be a certain number of inches but because the accordion door is an accordion door the sort of valley in the in the fold of the door gives another six inches or so and kids have been getting entrapped in there, okay? When the doors close and then the elevator's called, oh. they get, yeah. And so it's, it, was, it was a horrible story. Um, oh, but, and, and one of the reasons why this is happening is that you do not have to have home elevators inspected. Like if you go to a mall or an office building, you have to have what? them inspected. You can see the little inspection note inside the elevator, right? If, if you look. The home elevators didn't and, and or don't. Uh, well, in North Carolina they do now, but 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 there's a plastic insert that costs a hundred dollars. Wow. That goes inside the door of the elevator that prevents someone from being entrapped. Interestingly enough, before <clears throat> this case, like a year before this case, I came home from work one day and I heard this noise going on. I was like, "What's going on?" And the guy was installing one of those plastic inserts in the door of my elevator and my wife goes yeah yeah we need to get this done how she found out it's remarkable right she's amazing and so that's my first that's how i first became aware of it and then months later i get a call from this tragic case about weston oh. and weston's parents are unbelievably strong i mean i can't tell you i still stay in contact with them how how much i think of those folks so they um we started an effort in north carolina called weston's law and it passed um, both the House and the Senate, Whoa. unanimous votes, that says that if if you have an elevator in your home and you rent your home out for two weeks or more, you have to get it inspected once a year. Oh. And so there and, and, and so it, it definitely, definitely is gonna save lives. Okay. And so um and, and so in North Carolina that's the law now and, and you know like Real estate is getting so expensive on our beaches in North Carolina mm-hmm. that you have a lot of uh, people come in and invest, and it's not individuals; it's hedge funds or yeah, you know equity sure. groups, and they're building homes because, and because dirt's so expensive, the homes have to go higher. So you're seeing you're seeing four story, five story homes, right? Right, and who wants to lug furniture up those homes? So they're throwing an ele- up the stairs, right? So, oh, so every home has an yeah. elevator. Yeah. Wow, what a message. So what do you do if, what does somebody do out there who's got a VRBO, whatever it is, and, and you're taking your kids and yeah. you show up and there's an elevator there? What yeah, do they th- do? thank you for asking that question. So what I tell everybody to do, I don't know whether if you're in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, wherever. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a law to do this. You go straight to the elevator. And if it doesn't have one of those plastic inserts or if you inspect it and you believe that space in between the hoistway door and the accordion door is too big or you're not sure, you know, get your luggage in and flip the fuse box. Don't use it. Don't use it. I mean, that's what I I have done. And, of course, now I'm, you know, paranoid about it. Yeah. But but elevator is nothing more. It's like like going to the fair. It's 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 an amusement park ride for a kid. What were right? the kids right? The it's kids an, are going to be what we up call it an attractive nuisance, oh. um, and so yes. So that's thank you for asking that question. So if you if you're if you're going on a vacation, you go anywhere, please inspect okay. the elevator in the home. Okay, wow. Because this is happening. It's happened before. I think there's been eight or nine, ten kids that have died or been profoundly injured in the last oh. short period of time. I can't recall the number of years. But and, and, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission's taking this up, 
And so um, we, we don't we don't want this to happen again. So it's not about trying right. to get a new case, preventing these injuries because it's just just horrific. Horrific. Oh, just to think about that. So this is all, to be clear. This is only in homes, though. Yes, because home elevators are not inspected. Are there any other elevators out there that are not inspected? Commercial elevators are required to be inspected. Most okay. every state in the country. So you go into your whatever it is, apartment complex, you go to a business meeting, you're going up an elevator, no issue there. Right. Because okay. most of the time the door to the elevator is the door to the elevator, right? It's so one door opening and closing. In homes, you have two doors. The door to the, the door house. to the house, which is called the hoistway door, and then the oh. door to the elevator, and it's that space in between the kids are getting entrapped. Hmm. I can't wait to send this out to people that I know that use those just just to help them, not to scare them. I mean, it might scare them, but to help. Right. This is going to be incredibly helpful to people. Right. Wow. Okay. So that was a that was a rewarding day, I would think. That settlement, in in a way, right? Like to get. To get that law passed, yeah. So the, the case resolved under confidential terms, and okay. then and then we we got the legislation passed, yeah, right, um, which was tremendous. And so mm -hmm. that that's making a difference, is changing, <clears throat> saving lives. You yeah, know, you can never replace, you know, a loss like a seven year old child, right? Yeah. So you can't really replace any death with money, like whatever. But that's the system we use. Um. But that you know, it was a it was a sad day, but a meaningful piece of legislation. I'm afraid to ask this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and don't answer if you can't. But did the company know that there was default in this over the years, well, and they just didn't fix it? Or? We believe the elevator industry knew. Okay. Wow. And because there's been um, articles written. Mm. Um, literature that there's a problem and and so you know like I, I one of the most powerful things i like to use in jury arguments is conduct rewarded is conduct repeated Ooh, right conduct so repeated. unless you hold people accountable in a meaningful way um there's going to be a system failure in the future and so that you know Look, you know, and this is getting on the far field, but look, look yeah. we live in the United States. We believe in ideas. Sure. We believe in starting businesses. We want to foster that. In some other places like Europe, they have so many restrictions and laws. That it's, you, it's hard to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So we believe in free markets. We yeah. want you to come up with ideas. And, yeah. and so in, in turn, we have less restrictions. Mm -hmm. So we, we believe that lawsuits are part of the free market. We help correct things, right? Yeah. For sure. And so that that that's sort of like you know, and so when I say systems failures, mm -hmm. that that's sort of what we believe we're you know we're fixing, yeah, you know, making things safer, perhaps more expensive at times, because they want to pass things off to the consumers, they being yeah. you know companies, manufacturers. But hmm. makes a lot of sense. All right, I'm gonna end on uh, I'm gonna end on this thought. What uh, as you look back at your life one or several what what would you what would you do differently if anything anything you do um differently? i would have taken a semester abroad and studied <laughs> <laughs> oh and studied I, abroad yeah I, I, you know cuz to me you know experience is is is, is what I, I cherish you know I, i'm looking to take my family over and live somewhere else for a little while at some point yeah so i, I don't really have a whole lot of regrets you yeah. know I, I i really don't um that might be just one of them yeah one of yeah anything anything come to mind from younger years like with with the challenges that you had in school i mean i would have liked to there? have known that 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 labeled in my my dyslexia at a younger age yeah which you know, yeah perhaps um but you know if you, you 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 know it's hard to unwind things it's you know at the end of the day i'm 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 proud of my body of work yeah i'm proud of of where i am uh, i've got a great family spectacular wife two wonderful little boys and so you know i'm happy yeah you know and um it, you know I, I i wouldn't trade any of that yeah it's awesome, man. Well, I, I'm encouraged. I'm I sit here and I'm grateful 
to have an opportunity to just sit here and be able to do the interview with you. The encouragement like that I have as a person, not as an interviewer, forget, just as a person. So, I mean, I, I want, want to thank you that. because quite frankly, this is really the first public forum yeah. that I have really discussed this. So it's, it's been very therapeutic for me and Good. my wife was very encouraging for me to come out here and do this. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm a lot calmer now than I was at the beginning of this interview. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> or, you know, and so, yeah, so thank you. I should thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you. I, st I still get, I, I get it, man. I still get nervous. I just, I have this absolute calling. I love this. This is my favorite thing on the earth to do is sit here and just learn about people. It's just fascinating. So thanks for being here. Um, to everybody out there, oh my goodness, I, I just hope this gets in so many hands. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I welcome the call, a call. If anybody can call me, I'm easy to find. Stacey Miller, just Google me, North Carolina. But pop up on Google. I'm happy to talk to you about yeah. it, yeah, especially individually. Um, if your child's struggling or if you as an adult just want to talk about it, I mean, I'm happy to. That's incredible. Oh, man. Um, you know, it's perhaps encouraging me to get out there more and talk about yeah. it. Yeah. And you're used to like getting thou waking up and having thousands of uh, communications, right? From the fire. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Which it's is a great going story. On, right? Which is such a great story. So, okay, thanks to everybody out there. Um, like and follow us. I mean, if you've gotten value, if you have friends, family members out there that um, may have a learning disability or just looking for a great story about hope, thank you for joining us today. And Stacy, thanks again thank you, for being here. It. Thanks for watching The Jeff Opeg Show. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on all socials.